Okay, welcome back. So we were looking at uh, another element of marriage in our first hour. We we're looking at boundaries. Um, we were uh, some of the key points that we had focused on is uh, to say that marriage does not come with self protection. It's not automatic uh, defense to uh, any forms of adultery. So we need to be careful. We we also looked at how. Um, uh, we find that when people get into uh, relationships of affairs outside of marriage, it's not, uh, it doesn't happen uh, suddenly. It's not, it doesn't happen on the spot, but it's something as a process where a friendship moves into an emotional attachment and then thereby getting into other forms of involvement, even of sexual intimacy. We looked at one part of how do people fall into this kind of a uh, um, situation. We spoke about what is some of the caution, what is, uh, how do we exercise caution? We said, uh, we've got to be on guard, we've got to be careful. Um, we have to beware. Uh, we need to be on guard of uh, times of crisis as well as triumph. We were looking at how we need to guard ourselves from really wanting to enjoy momentary uh, pleasure as against that which is lasting. Uh, we did see some of the consequences of adultery um, at the end. Now, we also want to probably focus um, on other ways of, of how we need to be on guard is um, the instruction also given for women specifically to stay on, to stay on guard. Um, we, we do see that, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a, a wise woman uh, is, is someone who, who acts with wisdom um, uh, just like a wise man is who acts with with uh, wisdom, but we are looking, especially in this in the in the topic, we are looking to how we we want to um, uh, you know really suggest and encourage women to being to being careful to being on guard. So uh, what it it is a it is a word to the married or to the single women to stay on uh, stay on guard with recognizing and discerning um, uh, men who probably are on the prowl, who are waiting to kind of attack or kind of bring about a, a sense of destruction. Um, what happens when a wife gets into um, any form of, let's say, adultery or um, affairs, it, it can destroy uh, herself, her home, uh, bring shame to the husband, to the children, just like a husband can bring shame to the wife uh, or to the or to the children. Now, but uh, so for for the women to remember that we need to stay on guard because uh, from us, um, you know, God has put in women the ability to keep a family together, right? So for the women to stay on guard. Also, another caution for the women is um, on on, uh, and and I think we will would like to bring it this way that one of the ways that we keep ourselves protected and defend ourselves is through the way uh, how we how we clad ourselves, how we dress, and it's important to dress modest modestly. Um, and so we will just probably look at a couple of verses. Let's look at First Timothy chapter two verses uh, 9 and 10. If, if someone can please read that, please. I, al I also ask the woman to be modest and sensible about their clothes and be dressed properly, not with fine hair, fancy hair, styles or with golden ornaments or pillars or expensive dresses. Western, but with good deed as is proper for women who claim to be religious. Thanks, Apo. Right. So what does it talk about here is uh, the the charge that Timothy is giving, that Paul is giving Timothy to tell uh, the women to be modest and sensible about the way they clothe and the way they dress. Um, uh, it, it, it's something that we need to be um careful about because uh, it is seen that um, men kind of are um, are turned on by what they observe and what they see so 
so for a woman to take care to dress and uh, clothe themselves in a way that does not uh, unduly get the attention of men and that sometimes may set us up for trouble so it it's an instruction for us to clothe ourselves uh, um, neatly and modestly so that um, we keep ourselves protection so it's a sense of self defense for us and it's a sense of uh, for a sense of protection for ourselves okay now uh, having understood some of this and what are some of the caution that we need to keep, it's important to look at uh, what happens, what goes on from here. What if a husband or a wife has gone into um, an affair or has experienced uh, uh, an affair? What do we need to do? So what if uh, a husband or a wife has fallen into sin has engaged in adultery or in some form of a relationship and uh, they do want to get out, what should be the way out? So, um, you know, because all of what we understand in the Bible is restorative and redemptive, uh, it's important to understand that there is nothing that is too far away or difficult or way into sin that God cannot change and save and restore, OK? So no matter what, uh, where you have fallen and how hard you have fallen, the only thing to come back strong is to have a heart of repentance, to turn to God, and to um, look to him for a restoration. And we see that it is only with the help of God that we can move away, we can recover, um, and uh, come up strong, come up, uh, come up um, uh, much more stronger. All right, you can come back a lot more stronger. So it's important to know that um, even though the enemy has caught hold of us at some place to really bring us down, it is with what God can do. It's with what God can change. And uh, so there is hope. Even if there is something like that that's happened, there is hope. And that's what we need to uh, look into, to be able to help people, to br bring them back to a place of uh, victory and to a place of restoration. Um, we also look at um, uh, encouraging people in in understanding what the love of the Father is. And one of the best ways that we have understood uh, the love of the Father is through the parable of the prodigal son. And we, we, uh, we don't have to go into that story, but uh, what we find in that story is um, the prodigal son, he leaves, uh, he takes away his father's uh, wealth, squanders it, and decides to come back. So when he decides to come back, he he he's in a place of repentance, and he realizes how what he did to his uh, to his own life, and what what things um, that he engaged in engaged in brought him to that place of. Um, sin or that place, you know, he he was in the he, he was in the most difficult position or most difficult part of his life, and that's when he decides. He says, uh, you know, my father has so much, and uh, there is so much that my my father can give me. You know, I can actually go back to my can return to my father's house, and he decides to do that. Okay, so and and probably that that was the only thing that was left for him to do. So when he was going to go back home. In his mind, he was even OK to just be treated as one of the servants in the father's house. Um, and he was actually thinking of what kind of a, of a um, invitation he would have, what kind of a response he would have. And he was probably even prepared to know that there may be, uh, there may be a lot of shame people may talk about him or you know scold him or humiliate him but we see in the word of god how he was absolutely welcomed with open arms where the father goes running to him with arms open wide 
uh, and and receives him with that unconditional sense of love and we see some of the some of the expressions of that love where he was given the robe he was given a ring and there was a fattened calf and there was a celebration for his return so uh, that's a picture of what uh, what we see when we return uh, from our sin so no matter what the sin is when we return the love of god is always there available for us and it's something that is unconditional the love of god for us is unconditional and much much more greater than our own sin and as the word says nothing will keep us away from that love which is in christ jesus so we can be absolutely um, sure of the fact that just like the prodigal son came back to the lord um, came back to his father when a person uh, fallen into a sin like this comes back repents he will be received with the love of god so that's that's the uh, that's the uh, that's the understanding that we need to have or even if you are helping other people through this through this these stages of life to know that they will be welcomed back with the love of god the next thing that we do see is that the lord is the shepherd of our soul psalm 23 verse 3 um, it it uh, brings about how he's the one the lord is the one who restores our souls so um, when you look at the picture of the shepherd and the sheep and there are there is a scripture even in isaiah that talks about how uh, all we like sheep have gone astray and um, we have gone in our, uh, on our own way, right? But who is the one who brings us back? It is the good shepherd. It is the, the, the Lord who is our shepherd. We do see in Luke, again, the, uh, the, the, the story of the lost sheep, that, that the shepherd goes, leaving the 99, looking for that one sheep that is lost and celebrates what he finds. So uh, again, an encouragement is that the Lord comes after our souls and he's the one who will make us whole again. So we have that assurance that no matter how far we turn when we repent, he's there, right there for us to mend us, to restore us and make us complete. So he is the shepherd of our souls. Um, even through, you know, even when we understand that, uh, you know, when we looked at what adultery is and adultery makes it makes it so destructive to the soul, um, we also we also learn in Isaiah again that the Spirit of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, is the is that which will move us from beauty into ashes, from a place uh, of heaviness into a place of praise from a place of mourning into a place of joy. And that is only done by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so God, by the power of the Spirit, can, uh, can alter things for us through this. When we know that his anointing and his presence is that which brings us out from that. So the Holy Spirit can do this in our lives as well. If anyone who has been through this kind of a difficulty, he can move that, take away everything that, take away all the shame and bring back the joy and the gladness as it is spoken about. The, again, um, even as we experience these spiritual truths, we also need to understand that there are some things that we may need to do uh, um, on a practical, on a, on a, on a um, on a physical basis there's some things that we need to do so we do find that when we when someone falls into adultery it's like falling into a into a trap and uh, it's it's only it's only god who can help us move move us out from there so to understand that the journey back from sin is one step at a time it is to move one step forward into that place of um, healing, into that place of wholeness. So even though there may be 100 steps in that process, to be able to take that one step will actually brings you closer to that, to the, to the place of freedom, okay? So what is it that we need to do or what? how does that journey begin? So the journey begins, number one, by not walking away from it, by, but by calling it what it is by calling the adultery or the affair as what it is, is which is sin. That you call sin as sin and not 
um, not making excuses, not rationalizing, not saying I did this because of the kind of situation I'm in, because I didn't have an emotional available spouse, or uh, because there's been no intimacy in my marriage. And so, so not finding excuses at all. You're not in sin because of somebody else is doing to you. You're in sin because of your own choice of, of getting into that. So we need to be able to see our sin for what it is and get rid of all the deception that that may be playing on in our in our minds. Um, what what happens when we deceive or when we when we build into those lies is that we're actually saying that our adulterous relationship is justified, that it is okay. All right, uh, and we're saying that uh, you know, poor me. It's almost like a victim, and said, "Poor me, you know, I couldn't help it, and that's why uh, I I got into uh, something like this." But then, what we do see is uh, that journey begins when we label that sin as sin, and know that more than anything else, you are answerable to God. So to to uh, call sin as sin. The second one is to. Um, uh, recognize the seriousness of what you have you have engaged in. How how far away from God you have fallen. Uh, how you have um, um, caused pain, caused wounds uh, to yourself as well as to that to the people who are in in relationship with you. Maybe it's your spouse, the children, parents. Uh, it is to recognize the sin and to know the seriousness of what. Uh, what has gone by. So uh, uh, that is a indication of the of the sorrow that you may be experiencing. But so when you're experiencing that pain and sorrow over what has happened, you are it it is bringing forth repentance. there there is a place of repentance. as it says in uh, uh, two Corinthians chapter seven verse ten, godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. So there should be repentance. You come humbly before God and take the responsibility for the sin that we have for the sin that we have committed, and that's important to come bear before God in sorrow, in repentance, in humility, and uh, asking the Lord for forgiveness. So, so that's so that's it. So the first one is to call sin as sin. The second is to get rid of all the justification, all of the lies. The third is to recognize that sin. Um, and and uh, agree of of what has what has actually uh, bought bought about it. So it is it is coming to a place of sorrow and um, repentance. Also, is a willingness not getting back into into that same sin again. And what's the fourth one? This this sometimes can be quite challenging, which is to cut off, which is to completely uh, break off from uh, from those those connections with the person that bind you to that person um, that in in your relationship so breaking off that emotional connection um, is something that you do you, you're not saying okay i will wait until the time i feel better or until i build myself stronger uh, if you need to uh, begin to feel free it's important to cut it off so what does cutting off mean and how do you deal with that um, we'll just look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30. Would someone like to read that, please? Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But now I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman and wants to possess her in guilty of committing adultery with her in his heart, so if your right eye causes you to sin, Take it out and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose a part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose one of your limbs than to have your whole body throw off to hell. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So, um, you know, it's uh, the example that's given here that Jesus is talking about is that of adultery. And he's actually teaching uh, about. Um, uh, how how should one deal with sin? How do we deal with sin when it when it comes by? And it's an example that he's using. And what it says over here is um, uh, to cut off, to break, to to completely detach away. And this can be described in terms of 
let's say amputation what does amputation mean if you have noticed um, you know sometimes when people are diabetic um, the blood flow towards a certain part of the limb uh, maybe the toes or some or, or maybe even the hands the blood flow decreases so much so that it becomes dead and so if you don't cut it off that gangrene or that infection or that deadness, deadness begins to eat into the rest of your body so as a medical term you amputate it which means you cut off that part which is dead so that it does not eat into the rest of your body and and you know it's it, it's that that same um meaning that it's being put off over here although it seems you know when you're looking at the scripture it says right eye causes you to sin take it out and throw it away what it basically means to say is to completely severe and completely to break away break from the clutches of it it is not to uh, to dabble with it a little bit and say okay this much is fine just one call is okay or just one message asking how are you or just wishing on the birthday how you know happy birthday it says absolutely not it says to uh, to to cut away that which can cause you to sin now it it is it can be quite painful um, and pretty painful um, but it is something that is causing death to the other parts of it so breaking free from an extra marital affair or from anything that is immoral uh, requires that cutting off requires that amputation and it's something that must be done you know, even if it seems painful it must it must be done um, you know immediately so uh, what else do you do it once you amputate you also need to recognize what is actually led you back into that sin what is it that moved you into having that connection and uh, work on that address those those uh, uh, maybe those those reasons as to why it actually led you to the place you were and try and see if that can be reversed so for example it may just have been spending time with the person too much of free time just chatting or just just having a conversation or actually discussing deeper situations with them so there in itself when you recognize that you stop that interaction or communication with the person or if it is uh, let's say if it is a disconnection from from your own spouse it is to to once the healing has taken place is to go back and um, address what has been the emotional distance that the person has been feeling and how they can work through that so you you need to recognize and reverse some of those choices or some of those things that you've done and completely move away from it the third thing is to uh, be careful about the deceptions and the lies that the enemy brings brings about and often what does the enemy do the enemy brings about doubts or it brings about certain um uh compromises or or makes you say you know you can accommodate this it's okay nothing will happen if you do this so uh you know like like we said just just a message just to say hi i hope things are okay that in itself is like giving giving satan some space so that he can take over so when you tolerate even the smallest things you are you are uh, inviting the enemy to actually play a lot more havoc so for, uh, so it is important to recognize what um, is the deception and the lies that the enemy brings about and lastly it is to get some form of help get the help of uh, of a counselor get the help of a spiritual mentor anyone who can who can support and help you to uh, walk out walk out through this now um, even as we understand that uh, sometimes adultery can be extremely difficult for a marriage it can it can bring a marriage to a lot of lot of ruin um, the person the spouse who who has experienced who's been the victim of this of this adultery or the affair uh, goes through immense pain um, questions doubt and just as much as the offender uh, needs help the the person who is the offended or the victim requires just as much of help and it may and it definitely takes a lot of time for um, the person who has been betrayed to forgive 
and to restore back the marriage. So, uh, and it's important to give them that time to work through this uh, emotionally. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, we need to be careful, especially um, among Christians, um, when we do see the situation happen, how we may be pushing the hurt spouse to quickly forgive and to quickly reconcile. Uh, it takes time. So we, so we understand that it may not be easy on them. And just like um, the other things, this uh, coming back to healing and recovery can be a process and a journey itself. So we need to know that sometimes people may choose to end the marriage, um, uh, which we do understand and which we know that adultery is one, one of the reasons given for a separation or for a divorce. So it is permitted in scripture. Uh, so they may choose to end the marriage or they may choose to work through it um, in time. They may be willing to uh, release that forgiveness even though, uh, even, even with the gravity of what, what has happened, or they may choose to forgive but may not choose to um, continue back in the marriage. Uh, whatever the case may be, we, uh, we do hope that people do come to a place of restoration and come to a place of not uh, in in to to be in forgiveness to to grant forgiveness and to receive receive forgiveness so the person who is offended definitely will uh, need grace to really apply what is what is scriptural and even they really require the help of a pastor or or people around or a life group to help them journey through this place so that they can move into that place of wholeness. Now, for the for the person who is the offender, uh, they uh, it's um, the one who is who is the one who has committed the adultery. Yes, needs to receive forgiveness uh, and also be in a place to honor the choice or the decision that the other spouse has made, um, and being willing to walk in love without any sense of a vengeance, uh, any sense of a retaliation, uh, no matter what the decision is that is that is uh, that is made. Okay, uh, but that will continue. That will that will mean that they need to continue to deal with whatever had caused the problem in the first place and and walk in a in a way that it doesn't repeat again. Okay, so this again is something that they may need to work through uh, through this. Um, so we do understand that in all of this, um, the Lord is there to bring about new things. Um, it sometimes it's it's great to see how people who have gone through the sense of infidelity actually uh, come out much stronger than before. Um, but we also do see times when people uh, do not get back together. They, they decide to separate ways. Uh, but then whatever has happened or whatever they, the, the situation may be, um, we need to be loving, supportive, and encourage people uh, who may make a decision at, uh, other than coming back together. Um, uh, so we, we believe and we trust and we continue to pray that it's the Lord who continues to redeem and raise them up for whatever purposes that they may have. So reconciliation, as we look at it, is something that requires two people's effort, both the offender as well as the offended, in order to get back to forgive and to come to come uh, to come by. So that reconciliation and healing uh, may not always follow a certain path. It it may come by in different forms. Uh, either they come back together, or some decide to to part ways. Nevertheless, whatever decision. Uh, they make uh, if 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 we are as part of a community in that church, we um, offer the best support and the best help and love and prayers uh, as they go through those those issues. Okay, all right. Uh, are there any questions? I know sometimes there's a lot of questions that come uh, in situations like this. So any questions up until now? If not, we can move on to the last part of the lesson. Yes. 
Go ahead. So how can we help the women who are in the rural areas to know these boundaries and help them to come out of this? Even though they, they know that it is a sin, mm. how do we help them? Okay. So um, when we're looking, are you talking about rural believer women? No, unbeliever. Okay. All right. So when it comes to see with, with believers, we have the word of God to bring about to them with the unbelievers. Uh, we do have we still do have the word of God, but we bring probably bring it about in principles. OK, and often it's um, if you are engaging with women um, in the rural setting, uh, you know, to 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 really build them up in how they can be effective uh, mothers, effective wives, uh, effective daughters, whatever, wherever they are, right? How can they be effective? And just like the Bible talks about that each of our choices have a consequence. And uh, we, may, we, we, can, we can never escape consequences. We could probably, yes, have forgiveness uh, and restoration, but consequences are things that we can't escape. And actually discussing with these women about consequences of, let's say, adultery or extramarital affairs is something that uh, that is a good thing to do. Because I, I believe we are following principles of the word of God when we are saying, you know, let's think about what can happen if we engage in an extramarital or in an immoral relationship, right? Uh, and that's something that uh, people need to be more and more aware of. Um, uh, I, I, and I think even as believers, for us to understand that when God has spoken about what he wants of us, uh, He, God did it because he, he knows that if we move into paths that are um, unrighteous, the consequences of it are great, not just for us, not in just in this life, but in the life after, right? So that's that's the that's a certain principle that we can use as we are talking to uh, talking to women, whether rural, urban, whatever, uh, talking to women, saying that the consequences of it affecting our bodies, affecting our souls, affecting our spirit affecting our relationships to to really get into that conversation where uh, where we have been given this life and this body this soul this spirit and we are custodians of keeping that impurity and anything that violates that will definitely create uh, huge destruction and consequences so if it is even if it is to unbeliever women it is using the similar principles that that each of, that we have read in this chapter. Does that answer your question, Lucy? Yes, sister. Thank you. I think we can start off uh, with the purity, uh, where yeah. they can understand it in a better way. All right, right. More than uh, you know, I think uh, sometimes the mistake that we make is, what will the society say? Uh, I, I think we should get away from that, rather than understanding that you know your own conscience remember the bible says that god has given every person a conscience right to to work so that in its we don't deaden that conscience because when we deaden that conscience is when we are dead to the spirit of god also so that's something that we can be, begin with not focusing it on as, as to what people will say not saying okay you do whatever you want in your private life but in your public life you shouldn't uh, you know, don't demean uh, 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 how you may appear, but that's that shouldn't be the focus. Our focus should be how can you keep your conscience uh, right and pure before before God and before man. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So we'll move on to the last part of the chapter, and this is um, a lot more of uh, uh, certain preventive measures on how can we stay within boundaries and how how we can establish certain certain moral boundaries um so it, it is it is to really uh, when we look at this chapter it's just not 
uh, it's not just about how we uh, that we should be on guard, guard, but how do we keep ourselves on guard? And there are a couple of um, pointers that are there, certain practical tips that are there, and maybe you know we can look through each one of them. Uh, there are quite a few. We will look through each one of them and and uh, just uh, uh, you know uh, unwrap some of these. So the first one is um, maintain emotional and sexual fulfillment within your marriage. So it's important to keep the marriage relationship alive by doing things together. Um, you know, the honeymoon period in marriage doesn't last too long. It's probably the first couple of months. And then it is a whole lot of effort to keep the marriage fresh. So a preventive measure that you can do is to continue uh, building uh, excitement, building uh, uniqueness, building fun, building uh, enjoyment, pleasure in the marriage and intimacy within the marriage. So to ensure that you're getting that sexual and emotional, physical fulfillment from that. The second, do, second thing that it talks about is not doing anything that you would not like your spouse to be doing. So not doing anything that you would um, object your other uh, the, your other the, the partner from doing um, the the third one is um, uh, if you are a working professional to not pair up with someone of the opposite sex for any kind of trips or business trips now this is not just for people who may be working but in any form of context to ensure that they don't pair up with someone of the uh, opposite sex um, it also it is again the next one is to refrain from going out alone um, or being alone with those of the positive, uh, opposite sex. Um, being careful about how you use social media, whether it be chatting, whether it be interactions online, um, uh, whether it be messaging, emails, anything that is that that happens between you and other people, to keep it open, to to not be secretive about it. Uh, and here also, it is being it's important to keep passwords open so that there isn't any sense of secrecy that comes about the next thing it talks about is to be able to guard your mind your thoughts your imaginations your feelings and affections um, so to to be careful to beware about where your mind wanders what it wanders on um, um, what what you're building uh, into your heart, the affection you're building out into your heart. So the minute that you begin to be, may begin to feel it, it's it's important to take it to God in prayer. Uh, bring, make sure that those thoughts are sanctified and made holy, and to be able to cast out or to break off or to severe off any kind of thoughts or affections that may come about. Uh, the the next uh, tip here is to maintain internal boundaries, which is. Uh, making that um, a commitment not to not to fantasize, not to daydream, not to think about someone of the opposite sex um, in your mind. You know, not to build upon what they said or how they look or what kind of comments they give you. It's it's a place that is reserved just for you and your spouse. And you know, it's it's when we break away those boundaries that we have we have internally is when it it doesn't take too long. To break the external boundaries that are there okay the next thing is to speak positively about your spouse in your conversation with others um, to really engage positively about your spouse and what they do and who they are when you're talking to others important things is to not uh, to not give or compliments, personal compliments to those of the opposite sex, like they're looking nice, they're looking smart, they're looking pretty, you should wear this again, none of that. Avoid all of those compliments. Um, next is to be careful in your interactions with the person towards whom you may have some feelings. Uh, it's important to, number one, cut off. Also, don't be too honest and do not express your feelings about it to them. OK, stay away from that. Do not give any kind of indications that uh, you, uh, that there is an interest being uh, expressed. Next is to not flirt and not to play with other people's emotions um, or bringing about or dropping any kind of hints. Now, this 
these kind of boundaries, I would like to say that it's not just for your marriage, but also for the single people out there, that uh, you do not play and flirt with other people um, in a way to uh, uh, seduce or in a way to invite them into a relationship. Uh, not doing that. That some of these aren't um, aren't right ways of um, of uh, you know soliciting. If if that if you do have an interest in someone, the right way to do it is uh, this is for unmarried people. All right. And please please get me straight. I'm, I was talking about singles here. If you do express an interest in maturity, you know, uh, approach maybe uh, uh, an older person or maybe the family or even that person you can approach in a very respectable way rather than playing and throwing about uh, emotions like this. Important to stay away from pornography or other related things that can uh, make you sin in that area of sexuality. Um, again, here it's to avoid counseling people of the opposite sex, especially when people do come in with emotional baggages or people want to discuss their emotional problems with you. It's best to, uh, someone of the opposite gender, it's best to turn them on to someone um, who's, a, who's a female leader or a, or a counselor so that those topics can be discussed there. Um, to also be intentional about cutting away all past relationships that you've had uh, after uh, before marriage. So after marriage, it's your spouse and you, and cutting away every form of contact or anything that could probably allow the say, allow the enemy to have a foothold. So completely cutting that off and dealing with some of that. Um, also to ensure that you 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 look very carefully about the situation that you may be in and um, cut off any any situation uh, that that can lead to uh, uh, emotional or physical relationships um, again here as it is said even if you're single ensure that you establish some of these boundaries so that you are uh, you keep yourself prepared you're strong in that area before you you also you get into marriage all right so um, this again, yes, uh, an, a very important chapter, not just for those who are married, but also for those who aren't. And uh, I trust that this is spoken to you so that you know, you're know you more aware and more careful about uh, about some of this and keep your keep your guards, keep your be careful uh, and ensuring that uh, you, know, you, you invite the Lord even in, in areas that may be difficult, especially in the area of relationships and uh, sexuality. All right, um, I'm I'm done. Would like to open this up for any questions that any of you may have. Any thoughts? Any questions? Any concerns? No questions. <laughs> Okay, if there are no questions, let's just close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your word that is so um, true and explicit about where we should be guarded. Thank you, Lord, that um, your word teaches us that, that in every relationship we need to le live a life of purity and, uh, um, and be consecrated, Lord, to what you have placed in our lives. Father God, we pray that uh, you will give each one of us the wisdom, the understanding, the discernment to know what is from the enemy, uh, what is it that we need to keep away from. I pray, Lord, that you will uh, guard our marriages, Lord, from the, the attack of the evil one. Lord, that you will keep um, each, each of our homes preserved uh, under the blood of the uh, under the under the blood father lord we pray god for young people in this call we pray for young people who may listen to this father lord that uh, they will um, they will they will seek a life of wisdom seek a life of truth father knowing that um, you honor and you you completely restore and and give lord to those um, uh, who who obey you and who who obey your word Thank you, Father, for the things that you have taught us. 
Lord, may we truly apply this, Lord, in our lives. Thank you once again and bless each student listening and who will listen to this. Father God, that uh, you are you are with them in their relationships, in their marriages, um, wherever they, they are in their season of life, Father, that you will walk along with them, lead them, Father, in, in every area of their lives. Thank you once again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, just a quick announcement, please kindly, for, for the online students, if you have not completed your assessment, please do so. Um, uh, I think it would close in by uh, Sunday. So please ensure that you do your assessments. And for the e-learning e students, you have time till the end of the course. Well, but please make sure that only if you've done these assessments, would it, uh, would it help you get your certificates. All right. Thank you so much. I will meet you all next week. God bless. Take care. Bye-bye.